a drug problem in the past. Can anyone just rock up and find like really crazy hard drugs? And Easy it is to fall into the underworld because it's basically surrounding you. Definitely not the shadiest neighborhood like for Vietnamese, but it's definitely the shadiest neighborhood you could be as a foreigner. Oh, like this is a real love. Like this, you know, this is just sex and money. Yo, it's the Mike Tyson of the Teffel industry, travel blogging, teacher teachering. One of your guys had children before I could kick them in their fucking head or stomp on their testicles before you could feel my pain because that's the pain I have, waking up every day. Learning the English to the youths and we teaching them the Englishes. So today, we're gonna expose you guys to the dark underbelly of the Saigizi. We're gonna show you what happens when ESL goes wrong. A lot of motherfuckers come out to Vietnam and they think that shit is sweet. They forget that they're in Indochina and that it can get a little bit crazy, especially you know depending on your temperament and your personality and the kind of situations you find yourself getting into. So it always makes me laugh when people portray this place like it's Korea or Japan. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a look into someone's experience, which is actually fairly common, but the stories are gonna be pretty great. And if you guys have never spent time in Indochina, Cambodia, Thailand, um, people have these experiences and I think it's important for people to understand really what it's like to live out here and some of the, the pitfalls and dangers that you can encounter. But there ain't nobody gonna stop you if you're going crazy. <laughs> Saigon, Vietnam, and I want to tell you guys a little bit about my story. I'm from Georgia. So what originally brought you to Vietnam, to Southeast Asia? What, what was your intentions coming out here? What, uh, what, what drew you to this place? And then when you got here, what was some of your first experiences here in Vietnam? What brought me here was uh, I went through a divorce. I, um, you know, I'm from Georgia. and. Uh, my wife was Vietnamese, and I, I decided to just to just leave America. Uh, I had been exposed to the Vietnamese culture and, and wanted to be back in Vietnam. I had come over here multiple times, um, so I just had this burning desire to to, to leave and uh, come to Vietnam and um, start a new life here and uh, hopefully have a, a better life than what I was living in America. Yo, it's the Marvin Hagler of the ESL business: teacher teachering, travel blogging, expat relocating. So we got the homie, he gets to Vietnam, he's got all the best intentions, it's the totally understandable. Lots of my clientele come here to change their lives, to change something that maybe they didn't want going on in their lives, or to just sometimes completely start from scratch. There's all kinds of reasons people end up coming to Vietnam. Um, and that seems totally sensible to me. So it, when does it start getting weird? It starts getting weird when you arrive, uh, um, when I arrived, um, I had been here multiple times prior, um, but only spending like a month at a time here and staying at my ex-wife's mom's house, so I wouldn't venture too far from the house. Uh, but when I got here this time, um, being freshly divorced, I found myself in these girly type bars. Uh, basically, it's just a, a bar where um, uh, they steal your money. And the girls will get up on you, and a lot of them are sexy, and, but all they're doing is trying to take your money. It's like a strip club, basically. Um, and so, but I found myself self there because they would do drugs there. And I had a drug problem in the past, years back. And when I got married, um, that changed, kind of changed my, that type of lifestyle I was living. Anyway, um, uh, I, yeah, so I was at these, these girly bars, and doing a lot of ecstasy almost every night and finding myself doing ketamine and, uh, and then eventually heroin. Um, but some terrible things happened at that particular bar. I had watches stolen. I had, two, I had two, uh, some money stolen. Um, 
whether it was out of my pocket or I don't know how they did it, but it ended up gone. Uh, so, um, yeah, like when I first got here, I was kind of living that lifestyle with a lot of drug use. Um, and then eventually, um, being an ex opiate addict, once I did that heroin, I, uh, I uh, basically got re hooked on heroin and met the dealer. And um, he, was, he, was, he was a good dealer. Him and his wife would deliver anytime I called for it. It's quite expensive. Um, actually, very expensive. Um, but it's pure heroin. It's not unadulterated. It's not like America because we're in Asia. So it's really good heroin. Um, and I would. Uh, I was sore and eventually I started shooting him. Um, like I had done years prior, years prior I had done that. Um, anyway, so yeah, when I first got here, it was basically just a drug-induced, you know, um, uh, field trip. So you were working, you had a job going, you're in a new country, you're in Southeast Asia, you, you're up in the girly bars, you're using the hard drugs. Um, was it easy to access these things? Was it, is it on tap? Is it just readily available? Uh, like, can anyone just rock up and find like really crazy hard drugs and prostitutes and like, you know, because like I already know the answer to this question, but I think there's a lot of people that are probably unfamiliar with Southeast Asia and they have this idea that they're coming to like a very structured and rigid society like Korea or Japan. Um, but in reality, it's a very, very different kind of place and it definitely operates at its own wavelength. And I think that if you don't really understand the, 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 the chaos that's actually going on, you can't understand how the society operates. And I think that that's where a lot of the confusion and the misinformation comes in online. So it, was this stuff just like on a platter for you? <laughs> was like, so tell us about the, you know, how easy it was for you to access these type of things that you were getting mixed up in, how it affected, and did it affect your life? Was it affecting your job? Um, what about like, you know, overall, like since you've been here, how's this experience affected you? Um, uh, yeah, it definitely affected my life. Um, um, and, you know, this, I didn't know that Southeast Asia was, was like this, how easy it is to fall into the underworld because it's basically surrounding you. Like, um, when I, the first night I got here, I went to this bar, I actually knew the bar owner, I had met her online um, about a year prior. And I sit down at the bar and I, I order a drink and take a drink and there's a couple girls there and they hand me an ecstasy pill the, the first day I got here. So I, I Okay, so I tasted it because I know what ecstasy tastes like, and I remember thinking, okay, all right, well, shit, let's do it. So I went ahead and take it, took the took the X pill, and um, and she would just text the guy up. He he, just, he would deliver it because um, we wanted more. He, he would be, deliver it on a. Sometimes these grab drivers will deliver drugs. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I I got some numbers from her, and it is it is so sophisticated here as far as the drug game, the dope game. It's so sophisticated and easy. Um, I mean, in certain areas like, uh, uh, what, what's that walking street called? Um, Bo uh, Boy Vien, uh, the guys will, will wave at you to come over to them and they'd ask you, do you want ecstasy, do you want heroin? And I, mean, I could say yes or no and whatever. I, I, I had said, first they said marijuana and then they, then they will quickly say the harder drugs. Um, but yeah, it's it's super easy, man. It's so easy to get these drugs, and the drugs are pure, pure. Um, every drug I've taken since I've got since I've been here is high quality, very high quality, way better than in America. Um, but yeah, one time I went into the bar, uh, the same, the original bar I had talked about. I went in there on a Saturday, and during the day she called me up because I'd party with the owner, and I went in there and they had the cloth over the door so it's really dark and so and, and there's a couple dudes in there and then like maybe three girls and I, they're doing coke cocaine off the pool table and I'm like all right well yeah, I'll do some cocaine so I did some cocaine with them. so it's, it's everywhere I mean it's literally right in your face and it's so easy to get it can be kind of expensive though you're gonna spend Amer American money you're gonna spend twenty dollars a pill on ecstasy you're gonna you're gonna spend uh uh about ninety dollars on a uh, two grams of heroin, you know, you're gonna spend, it's about the same prices uh, if, you, if you convert it to dollar, but, um, 
Uh, and then as far as and as far as like the like those girly bars, well, they're all they're all prostitutes. So if you pay, if you you know if you want to take a girl home or find a prostitute here, it's so so easy. Just go to a girly bar. If you pay every girl in there, pretty much, you know, she, she'll she'll go home with you. Um, very cheap, I don't know, you know, a um, couple million, and uh, and so that's all around, that's surrounding you also, uh, in certain areas of the city, I mean, it's everywhere. And then you also have um, massage parlors, and um, uh, I've heard of uh, even these nail salons, uh, you go in there for hand jobs and sex and, you know, the, the, the dirtiness, it's, um, it's everywhere. I mean, you just, you just have to open your eyes a little bit and you see it. Um, and yeah, and that's that's where I lived uh, when I first got here. I kind of lived in that drug-induced uh, prostitution. I linked up with a couple prostitutes and just dirty, just living very dirty. Uh, and I think it had a lot to do with kind of like the divorce and just wanting to, I don't know, a midlife crisis. I don't know, really. Um, and it was fun while it lasted, but it got it got pretty gnarly and pretty bad, and so. I actually uh, had this friend, and I I told her what I was doing. I told her the truth, you know, about like, what, what, dude, I'm like slipping into this uh, a drug addiction and a heroin addiction. That is what it was, heroin addiction. Um, and so I told her, and um, she helped me. Uh, I call off work. Um, they gave me quite a bit of time off, and I detox off the heroin. And, and I decided that fuck that, I don't want to do that. And so basically I've been living a normal lifestyle since and things have been great. Yo, it's the Muhammad Ali of travel blogging, teacher teaching. Um, so my man moves directly to Vietnam to, to the worst, most drug-addled, drug-ridden, sex tourist street in the entire city, Boy Vien. So Boy Vien, for those of you who don't know, is like the walking street. It's basically where all the backpackers first rock up, but it's also where all the, the worn out old sex tourist losers who've been in Vietnam for too fucking long and they're still teaching in public schools. It's where they go to cry and whine and sit with their fucking underage girlfriends all day. And my man moves a block away from it. <laughs> so we're talking like, it's definitely not the shadiest neighborhood like for Vietnamese, but it's definitely the shadiest neighborhood you could be as a foreigner, <laughs> like for sure. So, you know, I didn't have these type, same types of experiences as Misha and I, we rocked up into a very like cool little local neighborhood in District 3 in the beginning. It was very high density and polluted, but it was also like very local and chill. So don't necessarily think that that's always going to be the uh, ex around you. Where he placed himself, it was intense. So he, my man got mixed up in some craziness. like. Um, Mafia, prostitution, drugs. Let's let's kind of hear about what kind of rabbit hole this was, and when did you really start realizing what a sideshow was going on around you? And I don't even mean just the partying and like the the illicit stuff, but like your interactions with like how business was done, your interactions with like getting pulled over and stopped for tickets. Like, when did you start to really understand what Vietnam was and what what's go what's actually happening in front of you? Because I think for a a lot of people they can live here for years and I still think they can't see it they're just like wearing blinders so my life now is is radically different than what it was then, but um, uh, actually, I moved away from Boy Vien uh, to D7, and but continued to live that lifestyle and um, going to these bars and, and using the drugs and um, uh, you know uh, staying up all night and living this kind of trashy lifestyle. Um, and, and then I kind of started to realize that uh, like. The, First of all, I was like, kind of, what the hell am I doing, you know, with this drug, because I was addicted to it. We're talking about pure heroin here. But also, like, going to the bars and, and the girls, and it, it's very easy to link up with these girls, these young, beautiful girls, and 
they'll go home with you, and but they expect you to pay them. And then they'll text you and they, hey, you, you want to come to the bar? And um, so basically you become their sugar daddy. I mean, it's kind of what would happen. And what I realized that real quick, like, whoa, like this is a real love. Like this, you know, this is just sex and money. Uh, according to it's all drug induced and party induced. And um, so I quickly, very quickly, snap, cut that off. Like block the numbers uh, with those particular people. And then, of course, with the, with the heroin addiction, I had been an addict um, in the past. I had been on heroin in the past, years and years ago. And then I was married and, and living a normal lifestyle, um, drug-free. Uh, so getting back on heroin uh, was um, quite powerful because I was so very, extremely physically addicted and I would have to use it every day, and it, it got really expensive for me. And um, um, so that too, I was realizing, my God, I'm spending so much money, I can't survive, I won't be able to survive, I'll run out of money, I won't be able to survive. So that kind of sparked my, like, what the hell am I doing? Like, I came here to kind of change my life for the, for the better, um, and have an experience, and here I am living in, this, in the darkness, you know? And so, and I, I had a snap, I had like a, a God moment, if you will and um, came to my senses and then I told, got, got real with my friend and then she helped me out and, um, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, I started also noticing that um, a, lot of, a lot of what you're seeing is a, a scam. A lot of the businesses, I mean, it's all kind of a scam in a sense, like how everyone operates, it's, it's a cash-based society, which is very odd. Uh, to me, I'm, you know, I come, I'm an American, and just there's deals that are done, and people pull up on bikes and, and exchange, God knows what, and and so it's just so different than than America, and everything's right up in your face, like you're right next to everyone. You're on a motorbike, you pull up to a stoplight, and there's a dude right next to you who doesn't speak your name, your language, and looks at you weird, you know. So uh, it's it's just so different. Um, it, it's different living here. <clears throat> I, had, I had visited, like I said earlier, a few times, but like living here, you start to notice that this is not America. Like this is a whole different world. Um, and uh, people think different. Um, they're sweet. The, the, the Vietnamese are lovely people, but they, they, they process the, the world and the reality differently than us. I say us as, as a Westerner. Um, and you can tell that uh, it's as if they're hardened and living here hardens you because it's a hard life and a lot of people are poor. Um, anyway, so I just kind of started seeing that it, I just wasn't in America anymore and things operate different here. Um, everything from uh, uh, the police to, to uh, even restaurants and people wanting to negotiate things. and. Um, even just like the the, the coffee uh, culture too, like it's just different. It's so that everything's up in your face and it's very noisy. And um, so it was, you know, in the beginning it, it was a kind of a, a shell shock, a culture shock. Um, and I, you know, and I was kind of just like this uh, newly divorced man going crazy. And then I kind of realized, like, holy shit, like I'm, <clears throat> I'm in a, I'm in Asia. I'm, you know, I'm living this nasty lifestyle, I'm not at home anymore. Like this, is, this is quite different than, than, uh, than being in America, especially not having like, a ton of friends here, being new. Um, and, uh, and I think that kind of led to this, the, oh, oh snap, I need to get serious about life because I'm not at home, you know, and I don't have mommy and daddy to call. And so, um, yeah, so all that influenced all that influenced me in, into my uh, kind of changing of the way I saw Vietnam. Is I, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. But I think a lot of it, a lot of it is how up close you are with people. I mean, you're, you're everywhere you go, you're, you're you're right next to people. People will bump into you, and it's totally normal. They won't say sorry. They won't hold the door for you. It's just it's very different. Um, and of course, you're on a motor motorcycle all day, so you're exposed to the elements of being outside. And uh, I had done a lot of traveling for work at the time, and, uh, so I would get sunburned. And uh, it's just, you know, it's it's just a really different world than America. 
so it's so funny that it's like a tale of, of different cities, you know? It's, it's your boy over here, the Tommy Hearns of teacher in the Englishes and traveled in the bloggings and, you know, but because I grew up in New York in a jacked up, you know, kind of lower income family in a fucking fucked up public schools, I ended up feeling much more comfortable here and I sort of clocked it for what it was almost instantly. And like, I don't know, I, I feel like a fish in water in Vietnam. Like I've, I've just had a completely opposite experience because I come from an environment where there's a lot of high population density, crowdedness, uh, social problems. Obviously it's very different culturally because we're the West and obviously this is the East, but I came at it from such a different experience and like Vietnam felt like it, it was so comfortable in many ways for me. Like sometimes I would be going through Saigon and I'm looking up at the tall buildings and if I'm daydreaming, I can almost pretend like I'm back in New York. I mean, the architecture looks different, but the density in a lot of places is like the same guys. So if you're coming from like inner city, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, probably a big city in Europe, it will be different because it's the East, but a lot of the same things will, will feel similar. I think the thing that gets people in trouble here is that there's no one who's gonna stop you if you're killing yourself. It's extremely permissive. Anything you want, if you have the money, you can get it. Whether that's girls, whether that's drugs, whether that's jobs, <laughs> whatever you've got the money for, someone will find a way to get it for you. And you just have to have self-discipline and you have to try to take a situation and look at it. Unfortunately, my man had to learn it the hard way, but you have to look at it for what it is. I love Vietnam and I've been highly successful in Vietnam, but that's because I never had any illusions and I never tried to portray Vietnam as something it wasn't. It's a wonderful place, but it's not a wonderful place if you got a lot going on in your life. You could fucking destroy yourself here. And this happens all over Southeast Asia, man. Like we talk about No Joke Howard. I did the video on him the other day, the, the, the blogger. I suggest you guys check out his videos. He went out to Cambodia, he's on the Tramadol, he's with the lady boys, you know? I mean, this is a very common story and I think not enough people are honest about it. I think a lot of people wanna just like talk about how much money they make and like, oh, I'm a big shot fucking, Bro, if you're TEFL teaching in a public school, you're not a fucking big shot, you know? Um, there's a lot of people who are fucked up, and I think this is a dangerous fucking place to be fucked up. <laughs> I'm fucked up in a way, too, but I just have, like, I have, like, I don't have, like, really, like, drugs. I don't drink. I'm into athletics, and that's always kind of made it easier for me to not want to be around that, you know? And I've also lived in Asia for six, seven years. So my homeboy, he just shows up here, Instantly, he's in that world. So let's like, let's find out a little bit about some of the craziest things he's seen since he's been here. Because I've seen some crazy shit, but like I said, I didn't go down that tunnel. So, bro, what was the craziest things? Give me like a few of the craziest things you've ever done, and you know, or not even you've done, just that you're you've seen, you've been privy to. Sure. So, um, yeah, it was it, it, you know now that I've been here for for two years, I'm I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, to Vietnam and it's it's home for me. But um, in the beginning, of course, it was like I mentioned, culture shock. But um, the, the craziest thing probably that happened to me was I, my the dealer that I was buying from I think was linked up with the mafia, and um, because he would front me at times and then he, and then he would really want his money, and so I would have to come up with money. Um, but I. Uh, I noticed people following me, and I was at school one day, and there was a guy looking at me through the window, and I didn't, I thought, I didn't think anything of it really, and then I kind of thought, well, I was, I wonder who that was, he was watching me. And after school, I had to go put minutes on my phone, um, so I drove to one of those stores, where you go in there and pay for your phone, and I saw that same guy in the store, and he was looking at me, and as I looked at him and, and saw him, he ran back to the bathroom, and I realized, oh my God, this guy's following me. So I ran outside real fast to get on my bike, I was gonna jet off. And, and then all of a sudden he runs out the door real quick and jumps on his bike and bounces. And I remember the, the guard was yelling for a ticket and he never did get the ticket or, the, or he just kept it. Anyway, the guy drove, drives off in the wrong direction and I don't know, something snapped and I was like, holy shit, this dude's following me, I'm, I'm gonna chase his ass down. And I, I'm driving this pretty nice bike, a pretty fast bike. And 
and I chase him, and we're, we're on the wrong side of the road, uh, on the dirt, and it's dangerous, and where he's going fast, and so I'm chasing him, and I, I'm, I think when I'm gonna catch you, I'm gonna knock the beat shit up, and what I'm thinking, or who, who the fuck are you, or whatever, but, um, anyway, so that happened, um, the wreck wasn't bad, luckily, um, and the bike just didn't have any damage, luckily, so, um, but, uh, I continued to see people following me, um, and I noticed uh, every day on my way to work that, that these people were following me. And I, it was, I'm not a paranoid person. Like, I've never had delusions of like this, that people are following me. But I would notice these guys, same dudes, I would see the same guys would be following me. And then they, they would kind of try to drift off or, you know, they'd follow me all the way to work. So uh, I texted my dealer and, and, I, and I was like, dude, who's who's this guy fucking following me? Because I knew, I knew somehow they were like, he's like, oh, you must have met, met El Sosa, whoever. And I was like, okay, well, why the hell is he following me? I think I, 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 owed, I owed a little bit of money. I owed like probably two or three million, I think, maybe a little bit more. And I was waiting to get paid. And so I was on front for like a couple weeks and he didn't like that. So I realized that my dealer basically works for the mafia or he's working for it pretty sophisticated organization. Um, that's the craziest really it got was, so I had to move what I, is what I did. I moved in the middle of the night. Um, I, I also drove a nice bike, so it's possible that they were after my bike. I don't know really what they were after, but having people following you is pretty scary. Um, anyway, I moved. I moved far away. I moved in the middle of the night. And, um, and then of course I, I, uh, I eventually got off the heroin, so I, I canceled that relationship with that guy. I mean, I blocked him and everything. Um, and so since then, you know, uh, ever since then, my life's been different. Like, I, I, made, I made a change, I moved. I was uh, free from people following me, working at a different school, and um, off the drugs, and lived, you know, living the normal, normal daily life. Um, but that, that got pretty deep, you know, having people fucking follow you and that, it actually what happened was I got pissed off and I, I texted my dealer because I these people kept following me. I texted my dealer and I was like hey homie uh I decided the upside I said I was like bro dude these people are still following me I said I'm calling the cops and I and I said like something about being an American citizen and I'm gonna call the consulate he didn't know what that means like he's, he's some idiot idiot drug dealer right so anyway I scared him and and so I, you know, I, I, I moved too, and so I knew that he wouldn't know where I was at. Um, long story short, so that's as bad as it got. Uh, that was pretty, pretty gnarly though. And, but once I got off the heroin, they said those guys stopped following me, and I had moved. Um, I, I was free, and uh, and since then I've been free and living a, what I would consider a good, healthy lifestyle. Yo, it's the Mickey Ward of travel blogging, TEFL teaching, teacher teaching, ESL, expat relocations, toothbrushing, and educating the youths. Good body shot by Ward. Maybe it'll turn him around. Maybe. I'm talking, I'm talking about if I were, uh, uh, oh, see? So, my man chased by gangsters over heroin money with the prostitutes, the ketamine, and the craziness of living right on Boy VN. You know, guys, I'm telling you, it's so common. This story is so common. His story has a happy ending. At least he's like, oh, I'm gonna get my, my life healthy and focus on my money. Bro, uh, like one of my friends, he's, uh, he's based as an expat in Cambodia for a number of years. He had a kid die that he was renting a room to doing, doing opiates. I don't know if it was heroin, but he was doing some kind of opiates and the kid ended up dying. And he had to like deal with the family that came out to get the body, so. I mean, you guys gotta understand what it's like, you know? Like, Vietnam's a great place. Uh, there's endless amounts of opportunity here for somebody who has the right ideas. Saigon is a, you know, very burnt, you know, growing economy. Um, the culture is really cool. The people are really nice. The food is fantastic. But, you know, it is a developing country. I mean, it's not as underdeveloped as like, maybe for example, like uh, Nepal or, or Bangladesh, you know, it's definitely more developed than that. I mean, you know, for me, it's interesting because I'm sitting here as Saigon is literally, literally being built. It's literally growing. They're creating smart cities, they're building infrastructure, they're connecting bridges. It's absolutely mental. It's like being in Bangkok before they built Bangkok, you know? So it's a, it's a fantastic place to be, but it is a developing country. 
and it is a place where no one's gonna stop you from destroying yourself, you know? Um, there's not a lot of systems in place for this, you know? If you come here and you get involved with the wrong kind of stuff, you know, life is pretty cheap, you know? <laughs> like, you can, you can die here very quickly. So I think, you know, I see it every day and I see foreigners getting killed on bikes. You, you know, I've been living here a number of years now. You, you, these circumstances, you hear it all the time in the papers. This one OD'd, this one went missing. Uh, people do get kidnapped. Um, taxis, if you take these on mark cabs and you don't know where they're gonna take you. People get roofied. Um, people get roofied and, and kidnapped and sometimes it's just for money, but sometimes it's worse. Um, there's a lot of shit going on, man. Like, it's not real hard to, for like somebody to get Rehifnol and just to put it on a cigarette and have you smoke a hit of that cigarette and then it's a wrap. And they do it. It's a common, common thing. If you go on any of the, the crime solver pages here, uh, if you go on any of the, the Fexpat pages for the girls, like this can be very, very dangerous place. It can also don't want you to be too scared because I've been here for about four years and the worst thing that's happened to us is Misha's bag got snatched by a guy on the back of a motorbike, like a ninja, like, you know, professional thief. But that was it in four years, <laughs> you know? Yo, it's the Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar De La Hoya hurts Carr too badly for Carr to be able to finish the fight. Brush your teeth. We teach her in the Englishes to the Utes. We educate in the, the, the Utes in the, in the language of the Englishes. So my man was talking about availability and about how he could basically get anything. Like how available is all this stuff? Because I mean, like I know you can go into the pharmacies and you can get the tramadols and stuff like that. I know that there are pharmacies I think that will sell people ketamine. Uh, I know in Cambodia for a fact there are. Um, it's still pretty easy to find the pharmacies that'll do that. Um, is it still like that here? Because again, I'm not in this world. <laughs> so so I, this, I'm curious too, this is interesting because I'm not around you know, buying legal or illegal anything. The only thing I do is, uh, you know, I'm mostly into my jujitsu. You know, every once in a while, your boy likes the four twizeni, but that's really it. I don't drink alcohol. So I'm, this is a world I'm very unfamiliar with. So it's extremely easy to get drugs here. Um, even at the pharmacy, drugs that would definitely need a prescription for in a Western state uh, or Western country, you would, you can get here, um, so you can you can get benzodiazepines, uh, Xan from Xanax to Ativan to Klonopin to Tamazepam, whatever you want to get, you can get it. The ketamine, uh, I uh, I've seen ketamine on the street, not at a pharmacy, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure you can. Um, you can get steroids at pharmacies, um, so that's you know, and that's all over. That's all over the the the, the, the city. Um, <clears throat> I had a certain pharmacy that I went to, but um, so you got that, and then also, I mean, like I said, uh, in certain streets, you'll have guys wave at you, and if you pull over, I pulled over one day and went over to him, and he he said marijuana, or or, or and I kind of shook my head at the time, and then he, he said heroin. So they're they're right, it's right in front of you. If you ask for it, especially like if you're really seeking it out, you're gonna find it. Because um, it's, it's, it's right in your face. I mentioned how sophisticated it was. So when I got here, I would, I would literally get messages from people on Zol random Zolo messages in Facebook of guys mentioning marijuana. It's always marijuana and steroids also. Um, and then uh, that can be a good thing too. So you can get dangerous drugs really uh, very easily. Um, they're extremely potent if you're into opiates. Um, they, the, Vietnam has locked up opiates. They, they don't use a lot of opiates because there's a heroin problem here. Um, so uh, um, that means if you are opi opiate addict, you're going to be doing heroin, heroin um, which of course can, is dangerous. Um, luckily, it's pure over here. So, but uh, but it can be a good thing too because you know if you if I needed some psychotropic medication or antibiotic or you know some cough syrup or anything. Uh, 
I don't have to go to a doctor. I can go to the pharmacy. I even there's even online pharmacies, and they'll deliver it to your house. You know, 30 minutes after your after your phone call. So, yeah, it, it can be good and bad. Um, it's it's very sophisticated though, which is which is odd. And it's safe. The country is very safe. So, um, just the way it's done. I mean, you, just, you order it. You or you order it. It's there in 30 minutes. Whatever you want, uh, any, any drug you want, and, and it's basically pure. Uh, it's, it's quite quite phenomenal actually, but um, but dangerous. If you have a drug problem, um, I wouldn't. I mean, I just wouldn't come over here. Um, I mean, it's as simple as that. Because um, you you will end up dying. Because um, most likely you'll wind up on uh, on heroin or, or methamphetamine or whatever else is out there. So, um, but yeah. So the, um, it's it's simple, man. It's it's really simple. You got people waving at you on the street, and then if you ask for it, they got it. And these people, everyone here is about making money. And um, they know someone who knows someone, or they know the guy in the back room has it, or, so if you want it, it's right there. That, that, that's what sex ain't with drugs. Uh, sex is the same thing. If you want it, it's right in your face. Massage parlors everywhere, girls out, asking you to come into their parlor. Um, it's not everywhere, but, it, but it's, it's in certain areas of the city, so. Definitely not everywhere, but but it's there. It's, it's right here. I mean, you you can drive around Vietnam, and you know you can go from one end to the other, the other end in an hour. So uh, a lot of that dense populated areas, though, uh, it's right in your face. Um, you just kind of have to be aware of it. So, um, but yeah, the accessibility makes it dangerous for someone who has a drug problem. Uh, so I would be very aware of that. Yo, it's Savannah Holyfield, a travel blogging, educating the English to the youths relocating the expats services and the teeth brushing and dental hygiene and toothpick Tommy and degenerate Donnie we brushing our teeth and staying in school here's the obvious question were you worried about the cops were you worried about getting in trouble in a developing country because I would this is one of the reasons why I would just never do these type of things I just don't want to I want to be a thousand miles away from that world because I don't want no kind of problems with the authorities. Were you concerned about getting yourself in trouble? Like, I mean, they give the death penalty to drug dealers here. I mean, like, it just seems like a part of like the, in Asia that I would not want anything to do with, but so many people get caught up in this scene, in this world. And I, I mean, I guess that's always been like, since I came to Thailand for boxing, I like that the Vietnamese are more relaxed about like the, the, the smoke and the weed and things like that. And like, you know, it seems like their, their attitude is different than the Thai's attitude. But like when it comes to that hard stuff, it seems like you would be taking very dangerous risks with your life here. And I mean, these are risks, there's just no way I would ever take. Did that cross your mind? Actually in the beginning, um, because I saw uh, in those bars them using drugs and, uh, and here in Vietnam they do these nitrous balloons and so every at every all these bars you do nitrous balloons and you hear people talking about it on Facebook and um, and so it's as if it's legal I don't know if the nitrous balloons are legal or not I know in America it's not to to inhale nitrous like that but um, it's, it was so in my face and so accessible that I wasn't like super concerned about the cost for some reason and it's so sophisticated uh, that. It's just it's, it can, it's just such a quick transaction, and then they're delivering it, and so I wasn't too much worried. Um, and then and then uh, I had made a joke about going to be a Vietnamese prison, how freaking scary that would be to you know to get arrested for something and, and go to a Vietnamese prison, and how terrible that would be. So then I, I did kind of think about it a little bit about because um, I've actually been to jail in the past um, in the states for. Um, minor offenses, but uh, yeah, so I, I did definitely um, think about that some, but you know, once you, when, once you t take those drugs, I mean, you get hooked, you know, and so they, you don't, they don't worry about the cops, you're, you're worried about getting your next hit, you know, so um, that was kind of what it was like for me. I'm not too much worried, but I did have some uh, moments of clarity, so to speak, where I realized that what I'm doing is illegal, I'm in a foreign country. This is very dangerous. I'm addicted to this very powerful drug. Uh, yeah, I mean that's um, that was kind of the aha moment. You know, it really spooked me, uh, for lack of a better term. You know, um, but 
Yeah, uh, the cops here, you know, um, I don't know, they'll pull you over for anything and you just, you have to give them money. The, the other day they got me four million, so, um, you know, I'm, I don't want to say anything about the cops really, but I mean, you, you'll learn, like, come over here, you'll learn how that system works. I'm not going to go, and that's another whole other rabbit hole that they, the legal system would. Um, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I worried a little bit, but not really, to be honest with you, not, not too much. So total opposite for me, you know, because I had come from being on the streets in, in urban environments in the United States and growing up in a very street oriented environment that when I finally made it to Southeast Asia, I just went the other way. I had no interest in the street element at all. I, the, what I, you know, I think what saved me a lot was martial arts was uh, that I originally came to Southeast Asia for boxing. So that was my focus on being in Southeast Asia. And then as I got to know the, the culture in Thailand and I got familiar with the culture in Kampuchea and the, the, the culture here in Vietnam, I've just realized that I'm, I'm, I'm more fluid and comfortable in this environment. So I sought out people that were doing sports. I sought out people that were involved in different industries like the ESL industry, the, you know, the visa industry. And I made it an effort to build relationships in those communities. So I was just not in that world. Like I actually don't even like Boy Vian. I don't even really like walking around over there because there's a couple good restaurants, but I can have it delivered. I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to be around all that. It's the same with Taudien, like I'm in Taudien now after living in the city center for like four years because it's a health question. Like I don't go to the expat bars. That's not really my thing. Like I'm kind of a, a bit of a family oriented. I do my sports. I like to travel. Um, that's where I'm out of my life. You know, I already did the street shit in America and I just don't want it around me. So I've had a completely different experience in Vietnam and it just goes to show how you can come and to this place and you can have these two different worlds and these two different experiences. But again, because I grew up in the streets in New York, I had my eyes open. I saw, I saw Vietnam for what it was. My man came from a more rural environment where this was very new, you know, and like, you could get really hurt if you don't have an understanding of the kind of place that you're coming to. And if you go on these teacher teacher forums or these travel blogs, they're not going to give you a clear picture of reality. You know, like Vietnam is one of the probably places in life that I will never forget. I will owe my allegiance to this country forever. It built, it helped me accumulate a business. It helped me accumulate wealth. They protected me throughout the coronavirus, but I'm not like, you know, I'm not gonna say this is gonna be a good situation for all of you. Some people are gonna come out here and they're gonna end up fucking dead. Like, it's just a matter, it happens. Like, I was driving on the, the, the Saigon Bridge and this is like, like maybe about seven months, eight months ago, and there was a lot of traffic. Turns out some kid from South Africa thought he could drive like the locals. He got onto the other lane, bop, they just dead on the bridge and they, jammed everything up and that's the traffic we were in where this, this this foreigner kid got himself killed you know um it's a developing country it's not as undeveloped as india if you guys have been to like those places or nepal or even cambodia like the standards in vietnam are much higher and you can see that it's getting better every year you can see that there's more options for services that were not available previously. But you guys gotta remember, there's a very big difference between the big cosmopolitan cities like Saigon and Hanoi and more provincial rural parts of the country. So depending where you live, you, just, you can have a very, very, very different experience, you know? I do suggest to people that you should try to live in more local areas. Um, unless you have health problems that are pre-existing, then I would probably suggest you go out towards the fringes of Saigon, like District 2, 7, get yourself in a high rise, or if health is a really big concern. But I do think it's good to live in the mix of it all. But you don't have to live right next to the sex street. If you live right next to sex street, there's gonna be problems. <laughs> So, you know, like, like, I'm not, like I said, I'm not your father. I'm not going to tell you how to live. I'm, I'm, you know, listen, I'll, I'll help you get into the country. I'll help you get a job. I'll sort you out with connections, but ultimately it's up to you to live your life. And, you know, this is just one guy's story of a couple of the different ways you could go. So, uh, you know, I've had a completely different experience in Vietnam. I, I found that I think the majority of the Vietnamese people are good and hardworking and, 
You know, they're, they're generally very honest, but I also recognize that it's an enormous city in a developing country. So there's, there is criminality, you know, there is access to drugs. Like if you read on the FexPat pages, roofing girls in taxis, and you know, they try to get tourists to take these unmarked taxis, then they'll lock the doors and not let them out unless they pay money. They'll put roofies on a cigarette and they'll just offer you a cigarette. But this isn't like the majority of Vietnamese people. People aren't like walking around out to get you. 99% of the people here are very hardworking, very honest. There is a growing middle class in cities like Saigon, in cities like Hanoi. Um, if you, you know, you have to understand that it's difficult for people to make a living in most of Vietnam. So they come to places like Saigon because they can work. And that creates a lot of poverty because of a lot of overpopulation, because this is the place where they have to go if they want to make money. So everybody from the countryside is just rushing into the city. So it is a bit of a chaotic situation and Saigon does take some getting used to. But, in, but for me now, I'm very used to it. <laughs> it's very normal for me. Um, I'm happy that you're doing better, bro. I'm happy to hear that you're on a better path and I hope that Vietnam brings you success and happiness. Leave them with some final thoughts of what you think would be helpful to a guy who's maybe kind of in a similar spot that you were in and you know maybe you could help them avoid some headaches yeah so kind of as a pre-warning uh you mentioned um and i had mentioned it it's definitely a d different world um i had been here multiple times prior but living here and like really being immersed in the culture uh it's different um thanks god uh my life turned around and um, I'm, I'm doing quite well now, but um, yeah, it, it, this is, it's, it's a very different world and, um, and it, you, it's right up on your face and, and you, you see things happening and um, uh, all of that's true, the, the roofing stories are true, uh, I've seen it, I've heard stories, my, like I said, my ex-wife told me to look out for all these different scams and fake taxis and Okay, because people, the, the reason why they work here is to eat. I mean, I mean, it's a poor country, and they work to eat, and and they'll take your phone, snatch your phone, snatch your bag, um, steal your motorbike, um, you know. So, uh, yeah, it, um, it's, it's quite different. But coming over here, if you if you first of all, if you're, if you're a drug addict and you already have problems with drugs, I wouldn't come over here. I just wouldn't, um, if you have a serious issue with drugs, because you're gonna get, you'll, you'll get on better drugs here. Um, it's, and like I said, it's so sophisticated, the, the, the drug game here, that you just text them. Actually, they'll, they'll text you on Facebook. It's the strangest thing. They find you and message you, you marijuana, or, uh, steroids, or whatever you want, and they'll deliver it to your house for cheap, you know, for fairly cheap. So, um, yeah, so if you're a drug addict, I wouldn't come here. If, you know, the sex tourism, Jesus, don't, you know, don't, don't come here for that. That is disgusting and dangerous. You'll wind up dead. You'll wind up dead because they'll, they'll roof you and, and rape you and, uh, and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be a goner for sure. Um, I've heard multiple stories like this. So um, be prepared. Just be prepared. And, and, and like you said, uh, move, move, uh, don't move to the city center. And that just kind of happened. I just kind of, I, I picked a spot real quick and, um, and went there and... Uh, the Boy Vienna area, in the very middle one. Um, but don't do that. Move, maybe move to where the expats are, maybe, maybe move close to your work. Or, um, but definitely, if you have any prior issues or uh, drug problems or alcoholism, I wouldn't come here. And if, if, you, if you're thinking about coming here for, for girls and sex, you're going to get it. It's, it. it's everywhere. But I mean, is that, is that really a reason to, to move? I mean, that's just kind of disgusting. Um, and it's here though, so um, just kind of be pre-warned. And uh, I had done a lot of talking um, with Jay prior to this, and um, and uh, I had been here before, so I had a, somewhat of an idea. But once you're here, you're here, and. Uh, and you know, of course, you hop on a plane and go home. But I mean, sometimes that's not always easy. And um, so, uh, and you have to work. You know, you have to. The conditions are different. It's very hot. Um, sometimes you might have to travel long for work. You'll work in multiple places if you're teaching. You'll go to four different schools in one day. Sometimes, and so that's that can be different. And um, 
uh, traffic and uh, but yeah just maybe be, be try to be mentally prepared for for a different world you know if you're coming from a western country especially america to just be just be prepared mentally to be you know, somewhere else you're not in kansas anymore Yo, it's the Lennox Lewis of Travel Blogging Relocating Services. We brush in the teeth, we teach her in the Englishes to the Utes. He came to up here, instead of jab and right hand, it was hook and right hand. And you know what? The old saying, never follow a punch you around. And Rockman did. Rockman made the fatal mistake. I'm going so for me, when I first came out to the Big Side Yeezy, what we were doing was we were in the city center, but you guys can't think of it cannot think of a city center in Asia the way you think of a city center in the West. The city center here is like District 1, 3, to some extent 10, 5. So there's an enormous city center. The area that he moved is the walking street. It's like a toned down, more mellow version of the Thai walking streets for those of you who've been to places like Bangkok or even Chiang Mai has Loy Crow Road. Um, it's quieter here. It's a little bit of mix also of kids going to clubs and, and backpackers. So it's not as crazy as like Soy Cowboy or Nana Plaza, you know, but a lot less tourist infrastructure as far as security and tourist police. It's still pretty much the Wild West in terms of what is happening. So he moved right to that area. So he was immersed in that. You know, so that shapes your experiences. And very often times when people are on these travel forums, you do see it quite a lot. I'll never go back to Vietnam and da 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 da. A lot of times it's because they come to these areas and then they have that experience and then they superimpose that experience on the entire country. Whereas for me, it was very different. Like we moved very explicitly to a, a very local part of the city center. So we were still in the city center but we were in a very, very local area and we had a completely opposite experience. Like we didn't really feel like we had to watch our back much at all. I mean, obviously I come from a big city, so I'm always kind of looking around. And I mean, obviously there's a lot of movement here at all times. So it's, it's, it's very hectic, you know? And I, you know, we would do things like we use our cell phone, we back to the wall first. I've done some old videos on a Saigon safe. With common sense, in my opinion, guys, Saigon is very safe. But if we're talking about violent crime, if we're talking about petty crime, if we're talking about motorbike accidents, then no, it's probably not that safe. But it has a lot to do with the world you're in. And the homie was in a very, very different world than what I have been in, you know? Like I've been around guys doing sports. I've been around people who are doing business. I, I, I did the taffle taffle thing. You guys have followed me through this journey, but I never really drink. I don't go to the old man bars. I'm not here for the girls, I'm married. So I had a very different experience. So his experience doesn't mean that's gonna be your experience, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to look at somebody who made a couple of wrong decisions. Thank God he's doing better now because a lot of people don't make it out. Like if you're in that world, then Vietnam is extremely dangerous. <laughs> like, you know, but if you're not in that world, it can be cool, it can be a safe place. Um, I suggest live close to where you work, if you, you know, whatever you do. Um, you don't need to come to an expat area, you can live in a local area, just don't, just, you know, don't live right next to the, where all the tourists are and it's gonna be okay. Like, the Vietnamese are generally pretty good, like, they'll help you if they think you're in some trouble, they're pretty decent, like, overall. Like, I've seen guys, like, jump down and get a girl's phone out from a sewer. They, they literally jump off their bikes, pull the sewer apart, go to help her. I've seen people stop thieves that were trying to steal from foreigners. Um, you know, I say the vast majority of the Vietnamese are very, very decent, friendly, cool people. But anytime that you have massive overpopulation in a country where there's not necessarily wealth equality, unfortunately, you're gonna have this type of stuff. If this was a Western country living under the same circumstances, we'd be, they'd be ripping themselves apart. The fact that Vietnam has a strong culture really does make things safe. You know, like if you want to imagine what Vietnam would be like without the strong, you know, the strong history and the strong culture, you look at like Brazil, Colombia, the violence, it's the same level of like developing countries. They're just here, the culture keeps things kind of cohesive. So that's like a really good thing. And, and I don't want you to think Vietnam's not safe. It's safe depending on the choices you make. 
So it, like he said, if you have problems, if you're, if you're right now, your life is all fucked up. This is not the place for you, man. This is, you will eat yourself out here. But if you're coming here and you got your head on straight and you, you know, you, you know, you want to just work with nice people, it might take you a little while to figure out who's who, but there's a lot of good people here. And, and you know, I've, I've really been very successful in a short amount of time. And listen, I'm not a yuppie. I don't have a college degree. I didn't, I didn't come from a fucking great neighborhood. And I turned out to be successful. So homeboy came from like a better neighborhood than me. He's got all his documents, degrees, and he had a completely more crazy time than me. So it's not what you think it is here, guys. Don't listen to what you hear online, man. Vietnam is a beautiful place, but you know, it's not Japan, it's not Korea, it's Vietnam. They do things their own way and you're not gonna change it. So if you're relaxed and you can go with the flow, you'll be very successful here. If you're coming in here and you're, you're fucked up and your mind's all fucked up and you, or, or you're coming here and you think you're gonna change Vietnam or you think you're gonna, you know, you know better than the locals, you're gonna have a really hard time here. <laughs> Just go with the flow and try to keep your nose clean, try to surround yourself with people who are doing positive things. And there's no reason why you can't be successful. I, I, I mean, like I said, guys, you know, it's all about you. Brush your face and wash your teeth, son. Hey, what's up? I'm Dee from Canada. Hook up with the New York Nomad. If you want a smooth ride into Vietnam or any Southeast Asian countries. Hey, my name is Aaron. Get in contact with the New York Nomad. If you want to get into Vietnam, Hit them up, they'll get you in securely and professionally. Yo, this is Uncle Hollywood. I'm telling you right now, the New York Nomad got me a job. He's legit. Hit him up, check him out. New York Nomad set me up in Vietnam. <laughs> Yo, my man got me a job. Come to Vietnam. Hey, what's up guys? You thinking about coming to Vietnam? You're not sure where to start. You've heard a lot of things online. You don't know what's true. You don't know what's not. We offer a consulting service where we help you get on your feet in Vietnam. We give you advice on negotiating contracts with employers. We help you with real estate agents, visa agents that are reliable and that you can trust. We help you get started in this amazing country and get on your feet. We help you get into different opportunities that might be more difficult for you if you were just landing in the country on your own. And we help you avoid a lot of the, the pitfalls and problems that you could have as a newcomer here. We provide you with reliable job recruiters, visa agents, real estate agents, and advice. If you guys are thinking about coming to Vietnam, hit us up for a consultation. We'll help you get started, help you get on your feet, and hopefully you'll love Vietnam as much as we do.